Good morning and welcome to Jew in the City Speaks with your host, Allison Josephs, also known as Jew in the City. Our job here at Jew in the City is to not only break down stereotypes about Orthodox Jews and Judaism, but we like to offer inspiration. We like to show people how these age-old traditions and age-old texts can be relevant and meaningful in the modern world. I think one of the greatest stereotypes that people have about Orthodox Jews and Judaism is that this stuff is old and it has no purpose in our modern lives and it holds you back. And we like to say the opposite, that there's so much room within halacha and there's so much added value and meaning that these traditions and these rituals and these beliefs can give to a thinking, successful, modern human Jew. Um, and so um, there's all sorts of stories that we cover and all sorts of things that we like to talk about. And one thing that's come up several times over the years because our reach across the world is really pretty tremendous, not just for our social media platforms, which our following now is upwards of 90,000 people around the world. Um, certainly this show, when I spoke in Australia a couple of years ago, I had people in Melbourne say, oh, I'm a regular listener. I mean, it's really mind boggling. Um, but there are now Jews all over the world listening and connecting and getting inspired to be more committed to their heritage or Jews who already were observant but who are getting chizuk to you know, be more connected or more inspired. So it's really quite um, remarkable and um, it feels quite good to, to be able to be this force in many people's lives. Um, but one thing that I've noticed that's happened over the years is the, the Jew or maybe the descendant of the Jew or the person that has the Jewish heritage reaching out to us and saying that they have some sort of Jewish connection a few generations back and they want to reclaim it. Sometimes um, they know where the link goes um, and it was like, you know, a mother's 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 mother, that sort of thing. Um, other times um, they sort of suspect that they have some sort of Jewish heritage but have not been able to, um, you know, sort of prove it. Um, there was a woman many years ago and who weep. was married to a non-Jewish man and she said she had this inexplicable pull to become Jewish. A woman from Germany, she said when she heard the song Shalom Aleichem, she just got goosebumps. And there was just this feeling that she had to want to kind of come back, even though she wasn't exactly sure if she had a Jewish heritage. And it was a complicated situation because she was married, happily married to a non-Jew who didn't want to convert. So we've seen complicated cases like that. Um, but we've seen more uh, basic cases. There was a, a Catholic woman who wrote to us a few years ago, and she said um, she always had a pull also to Jewishness. Um, and then she found out in her adult years that her mother's mother was a Jew. She was raised in Italy during the racial laws. Um, she converted to Catholicism. Um, and I guess she found, only found this on her adult years. And um, she wanted to know why it was that she felt this pull towards the Jewishness because she's not particularly close with her mother or grandmother. And I told her that, um, well, there's two answers why the Jewishness goes through the mother. Um, on one hand, it's sort of a thing about yichus, that DNA. We didn't have DNA testing back in the day, so we can determine, you know, the Jewishness by birth. Um, but then there's a spiritual element that there's something sort of passed on in the womb. And I told her, I wonder, should I tell her the medrash about the angel teaching Torah to the fetus? Okay, why not? Um, and I said, there's some sort of idea that we have all of the Torah in this world before we get there. We forget it when the angel, you know, not literally taps our lip because people say, well, why do non-Jews have that little indentation on their lip? So don't take every medrash literally. That's an important point. But this this idea of learning Torah before you got here is that somehow when you relearn it, you already had it. It was already yours. Anyway, so I told her this medrash. She wrote back to me, I love this medrash that you told me because back when I went to Catholic school, we learned sections of the Torah as part of our curriculum. And the first time that I learned a complete section of the Torah was fourth grade. And my teacher said to me, wow, you must have heard this somewhere before. Like she really seemed to have like mastery over um, the topic and when she sent this to me, I got chills. Um, I had another woman from maybe Romania contact me who, again, traced back a couple generations to and her family knowing that she was halakhically Jewish. And she was raised with nothing, nothing from nothing. I think maybe even she was raised Muslim. And she said she saw um, some Torah online and it suddenly out of nowhere um, pulled her back and made her want to explore her Jewish roots. And she said, what's that about? And I said, well, I read this beautiful um passage from, um, I'm trying to remember who the chief rabbi of Efrat right now is. 
Um, okay, I'm looking him up right now because this is uh, the problem of live radio. Oh. Rabbi Riskin, there we go. Um, and But we have Google with live radio. So Rabbi Riskin has a beautiful passage in his book of this guy in Russia who um, has also for generations been away from his Judaism. He goes to a public library there during communist era. Somehow there's still like, a, you know, a Bible that's allowed to be in Russia and he learns some Torah and it makes him out of nowhere want to do a tshuva journey. Um, and when he connects with Rabbi Riskin, he says, he shows him a passage in Devarim, which says, um, when my children are far away from me, the words of Torah will bring you back. And I shared this idea with this woman and she also felt very moved. So these are sort of some small examples of how we have experienced sort of these uh, descendants that either have a direct connection or something they can't quite um, pinpoint, but yet feel this real connection to something Jewish. Sometimes so much more than those of us who are easily and clearly born into it. Um, and so I've noticed now because this really sparks my interest and because this really, I find it so, um, I find it emotionally moving and spiritually uplifting to see that Jews that are scattered around the world have this desire to come back. And it really feels like it's right out of the words of the Navi, of the prophet, of what was going to happen sort of in the days of redemption and with our crazy world. Gosh, I hope it's coming soon. So there are, there's this guy that I've been connected to on Facebook. Sometimes I just, you know, accept friend requests. I'm not sure who these people are or how I meet them. But I started noticing all of these different things he was working on, um, gathering Jews from different parts of the world, sort of, you know, lost tribes. Um, and I've been fascinated by his work. Um, for quite some time, and I finally have the chance to bring him on to our show today. His name is Michael Freund, and he served as the Deputy, Deputy Com uh, Communications Director in the Israeli Prime Minister's Office under Benjamin Netanyahu during his first term in office. Freund is the founder and chairman of Shave Israel, a Jerusalem-based group that reaches out and assists lost tribes and hidden Jewish communities seeking to return to the Jewish people. In addition, Freund is a veteran correspondent and syndicated columnist for the Jerusalem Post, Israel's largest English language daily, where his weekly column, Fundamentally Freund, has been appearing for nearly 15 years. A native New Yorker, he's a graduate of Princeton U University and holds an MBA um, in finance from Columbia. He has lived in Israel for the past 22 years and is the proud father of five sons, to whom, to, two of whom who have served in an elite IDF special force units. Freund is currently completing his studies towards rabbinical ordination and remains a devoted and loyal New York Mets fan. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. It's great to be with you. And I guess soon it will be Rabbi Freund, but I guess Michael for a little bit longer. Um, so I, I would love to hear, um, as you can tell from my intro, I'm really um, interested in the space that you got into, and um, I really find it moving. And I think in an age where we're such rational thinkers and we want proof for everything, you know, faith is a thing that doesn't have so much proof all the time. And for me, seeing these Jews that like literally um, had no reason to come back or didn't even know who they were, but had something in the neshama pulling them um, back to their roots is such sort of a point of strengthening my faith. So I would love to hear how you got started in this work. You were in politics, and then when, why, and how did you found this organization? Well, first just a, a comment about uh, what you uh, mentioned about faith. Uh, it, it was Menachem Begin who, uh, I think it was in his book, The Revolt, uh, wrote that uh, faith is perhaps stronger than reality because faith itself creates reality. Uh, so um, we should never underestimate uh, the power of faith, uh, even in our uh, rational uh, age. Um, I, uh, I made Aliyah from New York back in uh, 1995, and uh, when Benjamin Netanyahu was elected prime minister in 1996, I went to work for him uh, in the prime minister's office. I was the uh, Deputy Communications Director under um, uh, David Barilan of Blessed Memory, who was the Communications Director. And uh, one day in the spring of 1997, a small, crumpled orange envelope arrived addressed to the Prime Minister from a community in northeastern India, hmm. which called itself the B'nai Menashe, the Sons of the Tribe of uh, Manasseh and uh, claimed that their ancestors had been uh, one of the ten lost tribes of Israel that were exiled uh, from the land of Israel more than 2,700 years ago by the Assyrian Empire. Uh, and it was um, a very emotive uh, appeal to the Prime Minister to be allowed to come back to uh, 
to the land of their forefathers, to the land of Israel. Um, I read the letter, and my initial reaction was, this is completely nuts. Um, a lost tribe in India claiming to be uh, descendants of the people of Israel. It just um, it didn't fit with uh, the model or the, the perception that I had grown up with of uh, in, in the New York area of what Jews look like and act like and where they live. Um, but like I said, there was something very emotional and sincere about it. Uh, so I decided to answer the letter, and it, it turned out that the Bnei Menashe had been writing to Israeli Prime Minister since at least Golda Meir in the 1970s, oh. and probably since uh, David Ben-Gurion and the founding of the State of Israel, uh, but they'd never gotten a response. Um, I became involved in assisting the community, and uh, when I traveled to India and I learned more about their history and their traditions and their customs, I became convinced uh, regarding the historicity of their claim. I, I became persuaded that they are, in fact, descendants of a lost tribe of Israel who managed somehow, uh, with great faith and determination, to uh, cling to their Jewish identity and preserve it as best as possible down through the generations, and that um, now uh, they they want to come home again. Uh, so after I left the PM's office in 1999, I began thinking more generally about the issue of descendants of Jews around the world. Mm -hmm. And um, I read up about various historical phenomena, and I simply got on the plane and began visiting all these far-flung places, and I saw that uh, there are still many communities and individuals out there who have a historical connection with the Jewish people, are still conscious of that connection, uh, but that no one was doing anything to uh, strengthen their bonds with our people. And I thought that was a mistake then, and I continue to believe it's a mistake of... Uh, of uh, strategic importance, and it's one that needs to be corrected. So that's what prompted me to start Shave Israel about 15 years ago, mm -hmm. with the aim of reaching out to descendants of Jews and helping them to reconnect with their heritage. What's Shave mean? Shave Israel is Hebrew for those who return to okay. Israel. Oh, got it, like Chuba, uh, got it, I see. Okay, got it. Um, now, uh, what... Well, I re return can be uh, geographical uh, in terms of making Aliyah. It can yeah. be spiritual in terms of uh, formally rejoining the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. uh, for others, um, it can be cultural or intellectual, depending on what type of connection uh, they're looking for. In other words, uh, Judaism is not a missionary religion. We're not, we're not out there to put a yarmulke on everyone's head. Um, but I still believe there is value in cultivating a person's sense of connection with the Jewish people. Uh, even if he remains a religious Catholic in Madrid, uh, just the fact that he knows that his ancestors were once Jews is bound to impact him. It's bound to have an effect on how he relates to the state of Israel, how he relates to the Jewish people, uh, to anti-Semitism, uh, to things of that sort. So uh, at the end of the day, it's a win-win it's a no matter how one looks at it. Okay, so going back, I want to talk a little more about the B'nai um, Menasha. You said they didn't look like what we consider typical Jews. So I grew up, I wasn't uh, terribly observant, but I grew up sort of knowing about the Ethiopians as a lost tribe. And I know that there's sort of some distinction about ones that we can trace that, you know, remain halakhically Jewish and others that, you know, may be less of a claim. Why, why were the Ethiopians sort of more known to be um, historically or authentic, authentically Jewish, whereas um, there was more doubt? Like, it's just crazy to me that, like, for like decades, people ignored these Jews of India. So I guess why the first, part one of the question is why did we accept Ethiopians more easily? And then part two is, is there anything that you can pinpoint that made you believe the historicity of um, the claims of B'nai Menashe in India? Sure. Uh, with regard to the Ethiopian Jewish community, uh, there are sources from the uh, 
from the medieval period. Uh, there are uh, rabbinical sources that refer to the existence of the Ethiopian Jewish community. There were responsum written by uh, uh, a well-known rabbi, the Radbaz, uh, which refer to uh, the existence of, uh, of Ethiopian Jewry, as well as other sources. And it was among other, uh, it was among uh, those sources were among other reasons why uh, Israel's chief rabbi at the time, Rabbi Elvajer Yosef, back in the 1970s, uh, formally recognized the Ethiopian Jews as a, uh, as a Jewish community in every respect. Uh, by contrast, the B'nai Menashe, uh, they have been living for several centuries in a very remote part of northeastern India, which is uh, along the border of Burma and Bangladesh. And the first Westerners to arrive in that part of the, uh, the region were the British. And they only got there about 90 or 100 years ago. And it took them a couple of decades to penetrate into the interior of, uh, of some of those areas because the topography is... Uh, is very cha- is very difficult, uh, so th- that probably explains why uh, it's really only in the past um, century that we have come to learn about the existence of the Bnei Menashe. Though I should mention, interestingly, uh, the uh, the Vilna Gaon who lived in uh, the 18th century in Lithuania, uh, in his um, in comments that he made on the daily Amidah prayer that we say three times a day, where we, we ask God to gather the exiles from the four corners of the earth, uh, the Vilna Gaon wrote that, uh, in fact, that prayer is a reference to the ten lost tribes of Israel. Mm-hmm. And he says uh, there are among them those who live in the easternmost part of India beyond the Ganges River. Hmm. And he does not say explicitly uh, the B'nai Menashe, but he clearly identified the uh, the location where subsequently uh, the B'nai Menashe were indeed found. Um, so uh, in terms of the customs they preserved, uh, we know uh, that when the British discovered this population group, uh, they were astonished to find that uh, the B'nai Menashe uh, believed in one God, whom they referred to by the Hebrew word Yah. Uh, they they kept the Sabbath, they kept kosher, the festivals, the laws of family purity. I'm sure they argued a lot among themselves as well, and they spoke about a far off place called Zion, where their ancestors had come from, and where they uh, dreamt of one day returning. And they were still uh, carrying out the, the sacrificial rites, the korbanot. Wow. Uh, they didn't that get that memo. Per- performed in the temple. Uh, most of the community at the time converted to Christianity. And until today, for example, in the northeastern Indian state of Mizoram, about 95% of the population is Christian, unlike the rest of India, which is a majority Hindu state. But there was a core group among the B'nai Menashe who refused to abandon the ways of their ancestors. Mm-hmm. And it's that core group that came to serve as the basis for what we now refer to as the B'nai Menashe Jewish community. Mm-hmm. Altogether, uh, we've been blessed to bring about 3,000 B'nai Menashe and Aliyah to Israel wow. over the past 15 years. There are another 7,000 or so B'nai Menashe still in India all of whom are waiting to come. Uh, a decade ago, back in uh, 2004, actually, I approached Israel's Sephardic chief rabbi at the time, Rabbi Shlomo Amar. I asked him to study the community, and uh, he did so. And in March of 2005, he issued a formal ruling recognizing the B'nai Menashe as Sarah Yisrael, as the seed of Israel, as a descendants of the people of Israel in a uh, collective and philosophical sense. But on a personal level, he required each of them to undergo a formal conversion process mm-hmm. to remove any doubts about their personal status, 
And so in practice, that is what happens. Every B'nai Menashe that we bring to Israel Mm -hmm. goes through a uh, conversion that is overseen and administered by the chief rabbinate of the state of Israel. Are they taught? Meaning they're not just... They're dunked in a mikvah, obviously, but like I'm saying, are they taught like hashkafa and halacha? Does that sort of too? They obviously seem to have this yearning and connection, which I feel like when I think about the way that I grew up Jewishly in America, sort of proud to be Jewish, but kind of like don't get, don't let things get too serious here, kind of Jewish. And now what I've seen sort of with the, you know, assimilation, intermarriage mentality, there was an article written a couple years ago after the Pew study came out where this one Jewish guy basically said, yeah, let intermarriage and assimilation happen. Like, it's okay, we'll disappear, which was just like so shocking and upsetting to me. Um, So they seem to have this real like love and passion and desire, but um, are they being um, sort of properly educated so that it's not just the formal conversion, but that they can be sort of continuers and bearers of the tradition and pass it on to their children in a meaningful way? Well, um, they first made contact with Western jury uh, only in the 1980s. Now, even before that, uh, they had begun to practice what we would call contemporary Judaism as best they could. Once and after making contact with Western Jewry, uh, they then embraced uh, contemporary modern Orthodox Judaism. And that is how they live. Uh, they're spread out in over 50 communities, 50, 50 communities throughout northeastern India. Every community is centered around a synagogue. Uh, they have a, they've built a number of uh, mikvaot, of ritual baths. And uh, my organization, Shaveh Israel, we operate two educational centers uh, in northeastern India for the B'nai Menashe, uh, where we teach them uh, basic Hebrew and Judaism, and we prepare them for life in Israel. But on a daily basis, they are living as uh, modern Orthodox Jews. Uh, you, can, uh, you can go to northeastern India, uh, drive through uh, the jungle, and uh, reach a village with uh, 40 or 50 uh, small homes, in the center of which is a synagogue, uh, where uh, prayers are her- held three times a day every day. And um, I can say from experience that uh, you can show up at one of these synagogues um, unannounced, uh, catch a, uh, a mincha, an afternoon uh, service, and if you close your eyes, uh, you can quite easily forget that uh, you're in northeastern India. And um, uh, their, their faith is, is a real one. Their knowledge and practice of Judaism is deep and sincere, and it's for that reason that, uh, you know, when they do, when we do bring a group on Aliyah, uh, for example, just uh, two months ago we brought uh, 102 B'nai Menashe uh, to Israel, um, they're able to complete the conversion uh, usually within a month or two of arrival in the country for the simple reason that uh, they're not coming here and starting from scratch. Mm-hmm. They are living, uh, breathing Judaism uh, in northeastern India. Hmm. Do you feel like you are part of the biblical prophecy of, you know, Kibbutz Galias in gathering of exiles? Do you feel that your organization is sort of helping this thing that was said thousands of years ago actually come to fruition now? I would, uh, I would certainly like to think so. Um, I, I, I certainly do believe that we are living in a very special time period where um, uh, the Jewish people uh, over the past uh, century or two have begun to, uh, to gather back into uh, our ancient homeland, the land of Israel, from the four corners of the earth, which is exactly what the prophets foretold. Um, but in addition, uh, we're also seeing now the beginning of the return of, of the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. In other words, um, we have to bear in mind, most of us uh, Jews, people we know in New York, L.A., London, Paris, are for the most part descendants of uh, Ju- Judah or the Judeans right. who were exiled uh, by the Babylonians in 586 and then by the Romans in the year 70. Um, but the name of Asher and the Ethiopians perhaps as well, 
they are descendants of the ten tribes of Israel who were exiled 140 years before uh, the Judeans were uh, sent packing. So, uh, and if you look through the uh, the prophets, be it Isaiah, Zechariah, Amos, Jeremiah, uh, you will see that um, the prophets use particular terminology over and over again. They speak about how at the end of days, uh, Judah and Israel will be brought back. Judah and Israel will be reunited. Um, in fact, it's something that uh, every morning in, in the Shacharit prayer, in the, in the morning service, right before we recite the Amidah, uh, maybe we're not always necessarily paying attention the way we should, but we, we ask God, uh, We ask God to redeem, as he said he would, Judah and Israel. So I'd, I'd like to believe that uh, the beginning of the return of the B'nai Menashe heralds um, another phase or, or the next stage in the redemptive process as uh, not only the Jewish people are uh, coming back home, but uh, the people of Israel as a whole. Amazing. We only have three minutes left. This went by in a flash. I, I didn't even talk to you about half the things I wanted to talk to you about. Um, so tell me, um, are there any other of the ten lost tribes that um, we, I'm saying now we know Ethiopia, B'nai Menashe, any other places in the world that we think there might be lost tribes as well? Well, uh, the Ethiopians, I should just mention that when the chief rabbinate recognized them as um, as uh, Jews, um, it was based in part on the tradition that they had that they were from the tribe of Dan. Uh, so uh, that that is their link to the uh, to the to the ten lost tribes. Uh, there are many other communities out there in the world nowadays that are asserting or claiming an Israelite ancestry of one form or another. Obviously, we have to be uh, careful um, in making these determinations. Um, uh, just because someone asserts something doesn't mean that it's accurate or correct. Um, but I'll just mention one or two quick examples, um, two of the, the strongest examples. Uh, the first are the Pashtuns or the Pathans of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, there's a lot of very interesting historical evidence from the medieval era when various Islamic travelers visited that part of the world and noted the various Jewish customs that the Pashtuns were still practicing, even after they had been forced to embrace Islam. Uh, and the Pashtuns also had a very deeply rooted uh, tradition that they were from what they referred to as Bani Israel, the sons of Israel. Mm -hmm. And many of the Pashtuns until today still have that belief. Um, another quick example uh, is the, the Lemba tribe in South Africa and Zimbabwe, which for many years claimed to be descendants of the Lost Tribe of Israel. No one took it all that seriously. But um, once geneticists discovered the existence of the Kohen gene, which is a unique genetic mutation that exists among Jewish uh, Kohanim or priests, uh, someone went to the Lemba and conducted a DNA test on their priestly family, the family that had always served as their priests down through the generations. And sure enough, they discovered that the Lemba priestly family shared that same unique genetic mutation that exists among Jewish Kohanim, which certainly uh, bolsters their claim that uh, that they historically have some connection with the people of Israel. Amazing. The bottom line right. is that there are literally uh, millions of people out there who were once part of us, who were once connected to us in one form or another, whether it's hidden Jews uh, from Poland from the Holocaust to Moranos or B'nai Anusim from Spain and Portugal during the Inquisition. And uh, I believe that we, the Jewish people, have a historical responsibility, a moral responsibility, and even a religious responsibility to reach out to them, to strengthen our connection with them. And if they want to sincerely rejoin the Jewish people, 
then we should be doing everything we can to make that happen. Uh, okay. Instead of slamming uh, uh, the door. Michael, thank you so much. I'm coming faces, on a hard stop right now. I maybe want to bring you on again. Um, thank you so much for your time. This is fascinating. Thank you all for listening. And you can join us same time, same place next week. And best of luck with your work. Thanks.